Hello and welcome back to Bun Med, where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. In the last video, we talked about the physiology of clotting and the steps that we need to go through in order for us to make a clot after we cut ourselves. In this video, we're going to be looking at the specific pathologies that occur and things that may go wrong when we are not able to clot properly and the reasons behind those, as well as some of the histories um, and some of the management for these conditions. But I would really recommend that you check out the video on the physiology of clotting, as without it, this video would not make much sense. So let's just move on to quickly remind ourselves of the very brief processes that occur. So firstly, let's say we have a cut inside of our blood vessel. The first thing that happens is our blood vessel shrinks, and then we form this uh, platelet plug with the help of von Willebrand factor in a process known as primary hemostasis. And as we said, it involves two things. It involves von Willebrand factor and platelets. Following this, while this is happening in the background, we have some other things trying to form a very sticky fibrin sheath, which is very useful for catching on uh, passing red cells and forming this much, much uh, stronger and more stable plaque to make sure it doesn't get broken in a process that we call secondary hemostasis. And this process involves clotting factors taking part in the clotting cascade. And we also said that if we were not able to clot properly, we may have symptoms such as uh, nosebleeds, things like bleeding uh, excessively at the dentist or during dental extractions, uh, unexplained or spontaneous bruising occurring all over our body, things like purpuric rashes occurring, mainly over the legs and behind the buttocks, and things like bleeding into the joints. So in this video, what we're going to do now is take a much greater uh, dive into each specific condition and have a look at exactly how they lead to issues with the clotting. So let's start with primary hemostasis and the first step in primary hemostasis and formation of that platelet plug, the von Willebrand factor. So firstly, where is von Willebrand factor made? Well, von Willebrand factor is either made in endothelial cells or it's made in megakaryocytes. And forming this, both of these uh, substances will secrete this rather large and volatile von Willebrand factor into the blood. Now, this factor is quite dangerous as in its large and uncleaved state, it can grab onto a passing platelets and uh, clot uncontrollably. So we don't want that. Thus, this von Willebrand factor is cleaved by the action of an enzyme known as ADAMS13 into this uh, smaller, much more stable molecule. Now, for this disease, we don't need to worry too much about ADAMS13, but I just want you to keep that in the back of the mind as it does come to play a major part in another condition that we'll have later on. After having been cleaved, the newly cleaved von Willebrand factor will then bind to factor 8 in circulation and then circulate around the body and go to sites where it's needed to patch up holes that may occur. So knowing this, what actually is von Willebrand's disease? Well, von Willebrand's disease refers to a lack of or reduced levels or even dysfunctional von Willebrand factor in our blood. And the most common, this is the most common cause of impaired clotting. And often it can be uh, given out in an autosomal dominant um, pattern. So what sort of types of von Willebrand factor are, uh, von Willebrand's disease are there? Well, firstly, if we just try to think about this logically, we could simply have reduced levels of von Willebrand factor in our blood. This is type 1. We may have the normal levels of von Willebrand factor in our blood, but they may be dysfunctional. This is type 2. Now, type 2 can be divided up into quite a few different subtypes that we won't dive into, but know that in all of those subtypes, it's ha it has something to do with the fact that our von Willebrand factor is not behaving the way it's supposed to. And lastly, we may have completely or a uh, near complete lack of von Willebrand factor in our blood. And this can be quite severe and it can be life threatening as well. So now that we know that uh, in von Willebrand's disease, it's something to do with not having enough von Willebrand factor um, uh, or having dysfunctional. How what sort of symptoms might we see? Well, if we don't have von Willebrand factor, we can't go on to form the initial platelet plug because von Willebrand is what initially binds uh, to the exposed collagen. So we're going to see symptoms of easy or spontaneous bruising, things like prolonged bleeding at the dentist or during dental extractions, as well as this bleeding from our gums when we're brushing our teeth and things like mucosal bleeding, things like uh, nosebleeds. And also in women, they also tend to see quite heavy uh, periods and uh, menorrhea. So what sort of investigations are we going to want to do? 
Well, the first thing that we want to make sure is that this is not an issue with the platelets, and therefore we can do a full blood count, which is usually normal in von Willebrand's disease. We can also then do clotting studies. Now, I would just want you to pause the video for a second and just think about what sort of picture that we might see in clotting studies. In terms of the clotting studies, remember this is an issue with primary hemostasis, so therefore we're going to see a prolonged bleeding time. Now look, von Willebrand here is carrying factor 8, so therefore we're going to see a prolonged APTT, and we were going to see a normal PT. The next thing that we're going to do is want to do some von Willebrand factor levels, because we want to work out, are we deficient in von Willebrand's factor? And often in type 1 or type 3, this will be reduced. We can then do a von Willebrand factor functionality assay just to see if they're behaving the way it's supposed to, and this will help diagnose type 2 von Willebrand's disease. <laughs> so how can we go on to manage von Willebrand disease? Well, the first thing is we have to work out, is this a life-threatening bleed, or is this a bleed that we see sometimes at the dentist, it's not very life-threatening, and we can measure it much more conservatively? In the general sense, in the sense that it's not life-threatening, one of the drugs that we can use is a drug called desmopressin. So how does desmopressin work? Well, when our von Willebrand factor is actually made inside the endothelial cells, some of it is still inside the cells. Desmopressin helps to release a lot more of the von Willebrand factor from our endothelial cells and force it into the plasma, thus raising von Willebrand factor levels. Another thing that we can use is something that we call tranexamic acid. This is a type of fibrinolytic, meaning it stops the breakdown of clots. And it's very useful when used in the mouthwash form. So say, for instance, if someone's bleeding from their mouth, they can take the mouthwash and it should stop them bleeding. This works by stopping the breakdown of clots. In the more acute scenario, the best thing would be to replace the von Willebrand with von Willebrand factor concentrate. Other things that we may be able to do is give cryoprecipitate just to help um, the background uh, clotting cascade take place. And cryoprecipitate really contains fibrinogen, it contains factor VIII, and it contains von Willebrand factor. So you can see that how giving cryoprecipitate, we are actually replacing quite a lot of the things that um, are deficient. And lastly, we can also give platelets in a very, very acute bleed where we're not quite sure what type of von Willebrand factor this may be. Okay, so now that we've talked about von Willebrand's disease, let's now focus on this condition called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Thrombotic refers to, the, refers to its tendency to form lots and lots of clots all over the body. Thrombocytopenic refers to the fact that we are actually deficient in platelets when this process is occurring. And purpura refers to the characteristic rash that you may see along with it. Now, how does this link at all to primary hemostasis or even von Willebrand's disease? Well, remember I told you to uh, think about that enzyme, just keep it at the back of your mind, ADAMS13. So let's just see again how ADAMS13 comes into it. So firstly, remember in the normal process, we get the production of the volatile von Willebrand factor from our endothelial cells and megakaryocytes, which must be curved and cleaved by ADAMS13 into the usable form that's not as volatile. In thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, we have a deficiency or defect in our ADAMS13. And because we can't cleave our volatile von Willebrand factor anymore, this tends to build up in the blood. And once it builds up in the blood, this volatile von Willebrand factor actually can grab all of the nearby platelets, forming this initial platelet clot. Now, once the platelet clot has been made, it will actually also um, activate the clotting cascade, and this will lead to the formation of a fibrin sheath on top of the clots that are forming. Now, we know that this fibrin uh, sheath is actually very sticky. However, another thing that this fibrin sheath can be, especially when we get lots and lots of formation of these mini clots all over our body, is that it can be quite sharp. So that means when red cells are passing past the fibrin sheath, they actually get cleaved in half and split in half. Now, these sheaths actually these sheaths and cloths uh, tend to get deposited in small blood vessels. And because the red cells are being broken down, we can see there's a degree of hemolysis going on. So therefore, we can call thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura as a type of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia.
Microangiopathic refers to the fact that it affects the small blood vessels. Hemolytic refers to the fact that we're splitting up the red blood cells. And anemia uh, refers to the fact that we don't have any more uh, blood, uh, red cells in our blood or we have reduced blood, uh, red cells in our blood. Now, because we are clotting so much, we're actually tending to use up quite a lot of our platelets in these uh, clots that we form. So therefore, we tend to see a thrombocytopenia. These clots can then go get deposited all over the body, and one of the sites that they get deposited in is the kidneys, and this can lead to kidney damage and acute kidney injury. Another area with very, very small blood vessels tend to be the brain, so therefore, if it gets deposited in the brain, we may have neurological functions, uh, dysfunctions. Thus, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura actually presents in a characteristic pentad of symptoms. The first of these is a fever, and this is due to the neurological dysfunction that occurs and the changes going on in the brain. The second that thing that occurs is an anemia, and remember this is a type of hemolytic anemia, so our patient might actually be yellow or jaundiced. The third thing that happens is a thrombocytopenia, because we're using up our platelets, so therefore again we might see issue um, symptoms that they're not clotting properly, things like bruising, bleeding, and things like nosebleeds. We might then see neurological dysfunction, so this could be in the form of seizures, in drowsiness, coma, focal weakness, which means one side of the body is affected, just like the picture of that of a stroke. And lastly, we're going to see issues with renal failure, and this could be things like um, blood in the urine or even a reduced urine output. Okay, so what kind of investigations are we go on, going to want to do? The first thing we do is a full blood count, and we're going to see a normocytic anemia because, look, we don't have an issue with the formation of the blood cells, and we don't have an issue um, with the composition of the blood cells. It's more that they're being split because of these sharp fibrin sheaths. We're also going to see a thrombocytopenia. The next thing that we want to do is, because we have this a degree of potential hemolysis going on, is do a reticulocyte count. And remember, we said that in our anemia videos, if we have hemolysis going on, our reticulocyte is going to be raised because our body is trying to compensate. Another thing that we want to do, because now that we've seen we have a hemolysis going on, is a direct Coombs test. And a direct Coombs test helps us to uh, dis helps us to identify uh, and differentiate between an autoimmune a hemolytic anemia and a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So a co direct Coombs test is negative in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TTP. The next thing we want to do is a blood film. And what are we looking for in a blood film? Well, on a blood film, we're actually going to see the remnants of these blood cells, something that we call schistocytes because they kind of look like helmets. We're also going to want to do a urinalysis. And in the urinalysis or the dipstick, we're going to see the presence of proteins in our urine. And we're also going to do a use and ease where our urea and creatinine are often ra uh, raised because we have significant kidney damage. And lastly, of course, we want to work out, is there something going wrong with the ADAMS-13 enzyme itself? So doing an ADAMS-13 activity, uh, activity assay will give us that information to find out if our ADAMS-13 is working properly or not. So in terms of management, the first thing is to remove a lot of these clots and a lot of these um, things that are building up in our blood from our blood. And we do this with a process known as plasmapheresis, where we can filter the plasma. The next thing that we can use is something like corticosteroids. Other things we can use, now remember we're actually breaking down lots and lots of our um, red cells. So it's, it's good to actually give our body back what we actually need to make those red cells. So we should uh, give folic acid supplementation whenever we're using up all of our red cells. And lastly, because we have lots and lots of these clots going all around our body, we want to really minimize the risk that they might get deposited in areas such as our heart or our brain and uh, reduce the risk of a stroke or an MI. So therefore we can give aspirin. Okay, I know the symptoms of TTP can be quite difficult to remember because there's quite a lot of things going on. Um, but a good acronym that I got taught by one of my friends was FAT NURSE. Um, so instead of NURSE, you have NR because NR seems to be the most prominent in NURSE. So FAT stands for F for fever, A for anemia, and T for thrombocytopenia. N for neurological dysfunction and R for renal failure. So I, I really like to use this one just to help me remember some of the uh, some of the effects and some of the symptoms of TTP.
Another cause of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is this condition known as hemolytic uremic syndrome. We know that hemolytic refers to the fact that we're going to have breakdown of our red cells. Uremic refers to a state known as uremia, where we have lots and lots of buildup of nitrogenous waste products in our blood, usually due to renal dysfunction. So we know in hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, this is going to be where we have lots of breakdown of our red cells and something to do with renal dysfunction. So what actually is HUS? Well, in actuality, it's actually an infective disease and it's infection with a very specific strain of E. coli known as the 0157H7. And it usually starts uh, and usually occurs in children. Now, it often starts with contaminated foods and when we eat it, we get infected by the E. coli bug which often very early on causes a bloody diarrhea. Following this, the actual toxin released by the uh, E. coli can actually damage our endothelium. And damaging of the endothelium form, uh, leads to the formation of platelet clots, and as well as the clots, the fibrin sheath. Now you can see how we've set up a very, very similar situation to last time, where passing red cells get split in half, and thus we have the uh, hemolytic component. These clots can then get deposited in the small blood vessels, leading to a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And this tends to affect the kidneys much more often than any neurological symptoms in children. So what kind of symptoms are we going to see? Well, the symptoms are mainly going to be exactly that uh, of what we saw in things uh, of thrombocytopenia. So things like um, spontaneous bruising, purpuric rashes. Again, we're going to see symptoms of anemia, jaundice from the fact that we're getting hemolysis. But the differentiating factor here is that it's preceded by this bloody diarrhea because we have eaten um, the E. coli toxin. So what sort of investigations are we going to do? Well, because as you can see, the pathology is somewhat similar in terms of the end point to um, TTP. The investigations are very similar. So we start off with a full blood count, which shows the normal cytic, uh, anemia and a thrombocytopenia. Again, our uh, reticulocytes are raised because this is a hemolytic anemia and our direct Coombs test is negative because it's not autoimmune. Blood film will show these helmet shaped schistocytes. And finally, our urinalysis and uh, eusinase will show renal dysfunction. But the thing that will help us really get to the bottom of whether this is HUS or not is to do a stool culture for the E. coli 0157H7 bug or PCR to find the E. coli um, toxin. Finally, in terms of management, we want to mainly look at uh, supportive management. So this includes giving things like giving fluids if they're really, really deficient in um, red blood cells giving a blood transfusion, and potentially dialysis if the kidney failure is end stage. So what I will do is uh, conclude part one of the uh, clotting diseases here, because we still have quite a lot to cover, and it would be rather large to cover everything in one video.